This morning, again, we're in Genesis 22, looking at, uh, on top of Mount Moriah, I was praying about, you know, when are we going to come down from Mount Moriah? Well, not yet. Not yet. Lingering there. Because there's so, so much there. Um, what we have before us there in chapter 22, and especially when we see Abraham and Isaac going up the mountain, and we see uh, Isaac being laid upon the altar there, um, for example, in verse 9, 22, 9, and they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand uh, and took the knife to slay his son. Then the Lord broke through and it said, No, Abraham, do not do this. But notice here, it's not just that. Uh, we see um, in uh, verse 13, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket. By his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Verse 13 is that uh, what we call the doctrine of substitution. We looked at that last week a little bit, and I want to look at it again. Um, we see here uh, what the sinner uh, can't provide, and that is a substitute, an acceptable substitute. Now we you know, all kinds of religion, uh, for example, will offer up this and offer up that. Hindus, Muslims, all, you know, all their, their uh, offerings and things of that sort. But dear ones, they're never acceptable. They're never acceptable. They never will be acceptable because they are apart from the Lord Jesus Christ and His work. And they're not uh, prescribed in, in the Word of God. It's, it's not just offer up any kind of sacrifice you like, like Cain. No, no. And so God has provided an uh, acceptable sacrifice, a substitutionary sacrifice, where we see here um, Abraham calls upon the Lord and calls him Jehovah Jireh, the God, the Lord that provides. God provided a ram caught in the thicket. And of course, this is a type of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ as he's there nailed to the cross, the, the gospel. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And I can, I, I can understand why Ab, uh, the Lord Jesus would say, Abraham saw my day. There. He's, he's living it out, actually. Okay? See, God will provide a substitute. So think about it for a minute. Maybe this morning, um, you're rejoicing that, that you have come to the Lord Jesus, and He is your substitute. As we look at these verses this morning in Exodus and Leviticus, we'll see one thing that is, is needful, or one thing that these uh, Israelites would do. See, they will always lay their hands on the sacrifice. What does that mean, when you lay your hands on the sacrifice? And they confess their sins, they lay their hands on the sacrifice, and, and what happens is, in a sense, they're transferring their sins to the sacrifice, in a sense, they're identifying themselves as the one that deserves to die instead of the sacrifice. And, and that is the element of faith. So as we think about the substitute, some of us here, we, we've laid our hands on the sacrifice. We've put our hands upon the head, as it were. We've trusted our hearts and souls to the Lord Jesus, and He's our continual sacrifice, and He's our continual substitute, and He's our Lord and Master. And we remember the day when our sins were transferred from ourselves onto Him taken away there to Calvary. But see, God will provide a substitute. It was way back in Genesis 3.15, after our first parents sinned. It says in the curse, it says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That's Genesis 3.15. From the very beginning, God says, okay, uh, I have a substitute. But we can go on and we can talk about Cain and Abel and how they're taught about sacrifices and substitutes and all this, the, the divine worship that God has set down. We could look at Noah for a minute. Look at Noah in, in Genesis 8, 20 through 21. After the flood, after God destroys the world because of its wickedness and sin, it says, Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. Uh, Genesis 8, verse 20, notice what it says. 
something like Abraham here. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord. And took of every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Notice it says burnt offerings. We'll get back to that. Verse 21. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite and any more everything living as I have done. You see, Noah says, here's the sacrifice. Here's the substitute. But notice as we go on, it was a sweet smelling savor. God accepted it. Okay? Now, go back to Genesis 22. There in verse 7 and 8, we read verse 7 in the... Uh, I mean, uh, verse 9, but look at verse 7. And Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? You see, Isaac knew there, there was something missing. Where is, where is the sacrifice? And uh, in verse 8, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And, and that points there to the Lord Jesus. It points to Messiah Jesus. This is all that you think about the Abrahamic covenant. And we've studied through that in Genesis 12, all the way through the Abrahamic covenant. And God would bless and bless God would, and, and give him a seed. And that points to the Lord Jesus, Messiah, that would come. But you see, Abraham also knows that that seed, that Messiah, would have to die. How do you know? Well, we see it right before us right before us, as Abraham has tied his son and laid him on the altar, and he's ready to uh, thrust the knife into his heart. You see, Abraham is understanding not only God will bless him, and God will give him a seed, and God, the Messiah will come, and Genesis 3.15 would be fulfilled. He said he realized that the Messiah would have to die in his place instead. You see, Let's look at this idea of substitute, again, a substitutionary death, or a substitutionary whole burnt offering. Um, first of all, this, this word consecration, when we look at the, the, the pattern or uh, what, what is used in the scriptures about burnt offerings or whole burnt offerings, there, there are two things I want to look at this morning. First of all, it's consecration. Whenever you think of burnt offering, a whole burnt offering, it's consecration or dedication. For example, this may seem hard, but, or, you know, uh, when the Lord said to Joshua, go into the land, and the first place you're going to meet is what? The city of Jericho. It is a whole burnt offering unto the Lord. It's under the ban. That's mean that, that the first fruits was going to be to God, and it was going to be a total burnt offering. It was going to be dedicated, consecrated. Totally to the Lord. That's why the sin of Achan was so great. Because he took the things that were dedicated to the Lord. And so this first thought is consecration. And the next thought is expiration. Meaning atonement or uh, propitiation. The idea of how do we receive the forgiveness of sins? Well, the idea is that we need a substitute to pay for our sins. Let's look first of all uh, at this idea of consecration. Look at Exodus, if you would, 29. 15 through 18. Exodus 29. And, and the context, I'll give it to you real quickly. You know, the dedication of the priests. Okay? Again, the dedication of the priests. And you have Aaron, his sons, and um, the clothing, all these things. And look, if you would, in verse 15. Exodus 29, verse 15. Thou shalt also take one ram, and Aaron and his son shall put their hands upon the head of the ram. Notice that. And thou shalt slay the ram, and thou shalt take his blood, and sprinkle it around about upon the altar. And thou shalt cut the ram in pieces, and wash it in the inwards of him, and his legs, and put them unto his, his pieces, and unto his head. And thou shalt burn the whole ram upon the altar. It is a burnt offering unto the Lord. It is a sweet Savior, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Go down further. Again, there's other, other uh, sacrifices, things of that sort. Again, the dedication and consecration of the priest. And verse 25 is the, the point that I want to make. Look at what it says there. 
And thou shalt receive them of their hands, and burn them upon the altar for a burnt offering, for a sweet savor before the Lord. It is an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Verse 41 has the same thing. And so as, as uh, Moses is being instructed by the Lord on the consecration of Aaron and his sons and the types of offering, but the main offering he's talking about is the burnt offering. The whole burnt offering that's made by fire. The, and, and this speaks of total consecration, dedication. It was going to be consumed totally. Now, there's other, there are other offerings, you know, sin offerings and things of that sort, trespass offerings, but not everything deals with sin. But there are also wave offerings and thanksgiving offerings and uh, first fruit offerings and wave, all these things. You see, in some of the offerings, the, the priests would have a part, they would eat. In some of the offerings, the families would eat as as the sign of fellowship. But this one, this whole burnt offering, no one would eat of. It would be totally consumed. Totally consumed. As Aaron and his sons are dedicated to the service of the Lord. And the main point, you see, is what I mentioned in verse 18, uh, 25, 41, it says, and thou shalt take the, um, verse, let me see, verse 18, it says, and thou shalt burn the whole ram upon the altar, it is a burnt offering unto the Lord. It is a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Meaning that God has fully accepted it. God's full acceptance. A life wholly consecrated, dedicated to God, is, is a sacrifice that God truly accepts. Now, uh, this part of this consecration, uh, Aaron and, and the sons, uh, Surely, uh, points to the Lord Jesus, right? Uh, his consecration, his his uh, dedication, his you know. We read in Hebrews chapter ten. Uh, Lo, in the book it's written of me. Lo, I come to do thy will. He puts aside sacrifice and offering. He says, I here I am. You know, total dedication. You see, uh, the the life of Christ and and everything happened in the sense he was totally consumed, burned, you know, now my meat and drink, my, the, the, the fire in my bones, to do the will of God, to be totally consecrated and finish the work. That's our Lord Jesus. That's our Lord Jesus. Ultimately, perfectly seen in the Lord Jesus Christ. But for us, we've we mentioned that before in the matter of this substitute, this consecration, this dedication here in Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. Let me read it to you. Notice what Paul says, after getting through, uh, you know, the grand doctrine of justification by faith in Romans, the great book there on, on how God saves a sinner. He gets to, to 12, and that's part of the application, beginning of the application of all these grand doctrines, okay? He says... I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. See, Paul is saying, let the fire fall. Let the fire continually fall. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. You see, it's just acceptable. That's that sweet-smelling Savior. He said, wow, that... You know, uh, it, for years it was really mind-boggling that God would accept anything I would do. Even in, as a believer. We, we run into that, don't we? How could God accept this? Well, we we'll re realize it's all because of the Lord Jesus. Let me jump to that verse for a minute. Notice Hebrews 13, 15, and 21. These are verses that really help me to realize that, you know, that I, I can, not only the, the doctrine of regeneration, knowing that God has given me a new nature, he's, he's brought about righteousness, a new heart, a fruit of the Spirit, I see those things, and, and I bless the Lord, I, I'm encouraged by that, the, the work of God in me, but notice here, uh, that will never suffice, like one preacher said, even our tears need to be washed in the blood of Christ, even our best sacrifices need to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Our best works, our best efforts, are nothing without Christ. In His intercession, in His mediatorship, what He's done on the cross. Hebrews 13, verse 15. Notice it says there, in verse 15, right off the bat, By Him, that's the cause, by Him, therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. Notice it. I mean, you know, we can, we can give Him praise, we can give Him adoration, we can worship Him. That's what we're doing here this morning. Well, 
Well, why? How do we know he's going to accept that? How do we know that our praise and our adoration is a sweet smelling savor, even as the Lord Jesus offered himself up? Says by him. No other name, no other merit. Okay? Look at verse 21. Hebrews 13, verse 21. This is, this is one of those verses that just like, I just have to hold on to it. Make you perfect in every good work, to do His will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Notice it says, through Jesus Christ. It has to be through the Lord. The ultimate sacrifice, His, his grace, his, his mercy, His power, and the power of the Holy Spirit. But you see, but we can, brethren, we can come before Him and do those things that are well-pleasing in His sight. That's awesome. That's amazing. That he would receive my prayers. He would receive my thanksgiving. He would receive me as I come before him and say, Lord, here is this living sacrifice. Lord, let the fire fall. You know, let me be consumed. Let me be consecrated. It's always in Christ. It's always in Christ. You see, Ephesians tells us that we are accepted in the beloved. Dear ones, we can never be unaccepted. As long as the Lord Jesus is on his throne, right? And, and, and before the Father, and, and his completed work there at, at the right hand of the Father. You see, substitute, this idea of consecration, dedication, okay? That's the first thing, that's the first application we see in a matter of a whole burnt offering. Is that's what we see here when we see Abraham taking the knife and ready to, to put it in the heart of uh, Isaac. You see, it was a whole burning offering. It was a total dedication. And who's doing the dedication? Who's doing the commitment? Who's doing, in a sense, uh, it's Abraham. Final test, number seven. You know, uh, Abraham, do you really love me more than Isaac? How, do you, how will you show that? <coughs> The Lord says, go up on the Mount Moriah and offer up your son, your only son, your beloved son, your beloved Isaac. Go up there and let's, let's see if you really love me, Abraham. And we see that Abraham passed the test. You see, he was totally dedicated to God. He was totally consecrated to God. You see, it was as if he had like burned up, as it were, totally. Now that's so important. That's the first application here. The second word that we're going to look at is the word expiration. We don't hear that too much, but it's another word for atonement, propitiation, satisfaction. You know, when uh, the old Puritans used to use this word, and it's not used much today because like, most Christians and most, uh, uh, a lot of churches despise that word vicarious. Vicarious, what does that mean? Well, see, it talks about substitution. Okay? The Lord Jesus was a substitution. He, he, it was a whole burnt offering. As he died upon the cross there, and the wrath of God was consuming him. You see, he, he, not only his whole life, but there was a reason he was there to offer for expiration, atonement, redemption. All those words that speak of, 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 of substitutionary death and a, and a whole burnt offering. Turn, if you would, to the second portion of scripture, Leviticus 1. Leviticus 1. Leviticus 1. Let's read verses 1 through 9. Again, this is about the whole burnt offering. Again, this was a special offering. It wasn't, again, it, it wasn't just for sin. We find out it was for dedication too. You see? Uh, but the, the, the one uh, main use of the whole burnt offering, let's read it. Um, and the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, ye shall bring your offering of the cattle, even the herd, and of the flock. If, this, if his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish, he shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. And he shall kill the bullock 
before the Lord, and the priest Aaron's sons shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood around about upon the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into pieces, and the sons of Aaron, the priest, shall put fire upon the altar and lay the wood in order upon the fire, and the priest Aaron's sons shall lay the parts, the head, and the fat in order upon the wood that is on the fire which is upon the altar. But his inwards and his legs shall be washed in water, and the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. Now, you, if you follow along with me as I read that, you'll see, this is, isn't that really what Abraham did? Uh, you know, sure, you know, in this, uh, and how it's progressing. You see, in Abraham's day, it was seed form. He's offering up his, you know, he had an altar and he did offerings and all that. But now the ultimate was that he would offer up his son Isaac. But you see, it, it was to be a whole burnt offering. And, and as you get to Leviticus, you get to, like, um, verse 3, voluntary will. It had to be a free will offering. It had to be something that was not forced, Okay. Uh, we think about the one, you shall put his hands upon the head of the burnt offering. You see, what is, well, that's the word substitution. <laughs> see, this animal is, is taking my place. I should die. I have sinned. You see, that's substitution. And then uh, the idea that it is going to be totally consumed and the inward parts are washed and all that, again, it, it, it's seed form. It's, it's ceremony. Yes, it's ritual. It's shadow. We we'll understand that that it all points to what the Lord Jesus did on Calvary's cross. And we know that. But it, it, is, it is a whole burnt offering. Verse 13, um, notice it says, But he shall wash the inwards of the legs with water, and the, and the priest shall burn it all, and burn it upon the altar. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. And, and verse 17, the same thing. A sweet savor unto unto the Lord. You see, the burnt offering is an acceptable sacrifice, whether it's consecration or expiation, meaning atonement or uh, uh, propitiation. Notice, in verse 4 it says there, in chapter 1, it says, make atonement for him. So this is, this is about sin. Now the word atonement uh, comes from, you know, it, you can see it all through the Old Testament, the, the, the mercy seat, for example. The mercy seat that, that covered the Ark of the Covenant was, was the, from the same word. It means to cover. Cover your sins. Okay? Why? Because God uh, is a holy God and He can't look upon sins. Yes, but also He's a holy God that He has, he has to judge. And, and His wrath is His normal reaction to sin. Now think of that for a minute. His normal reaction to sin. But in, in the Old Testament economy, you see, God said, I've chosen Israel. Uh, Abraham covenant, I've chosen Israel. They're my people. And now I want to fellowship with them. Well, they're sinners. There has to be some form of what? Grace. And that's what we see in the sacrifices, in the washing, all these things. I mean, it was, it was a rigor. It was a yoke. We'll see tonight that was <laughs> talked about. But it, there was a reason for all that. To bring them to Christ, or to bring them to the point they would trust and uh, uh, fall upon uh, the mercy of the Lord. But you see, it was to make atonement for him. It was a matter of sin, uh, the matter of uh, expiration, removing of sin. Now, this atonement uh, uh, for, for, for the time here is it's a type. We want to look at the anti type, we want to look at the Lord Jesus. But notice here, while you're there in Leviticus, verse 9, what does it say? Sweet smelling Savior. Verse 13, sweet smelling Savior. Verse 17, sweet smelling, smelling Savior. That's all pointing to what the Lord Jesus accomplished on the cross as he died uh, to bring forgiveness of sins. You see, the Lord Jesus' work is a sweet smelling Savior. Now, uh, we, we can go to Hebrews. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10 for a minute. And the question is, Okay, and this is where the type and anti-type kind of end. You know, you see, uh, did these sacrifices actually take away sin? 
You know, the thousands and thousands of liters and gallons and whatever you want to put it in, uh, that all the, all the animals that were shed from, from Abel all the way to the last sacrifice there. Did it take away sin? Did it atone for sin? Did it expatiate? Did it remove sin, guilt, liability, the wrath of God? And the answer is absolutely not. And it was pointing uh, to the Lord Jesus, what He would accomplish as our substitute upon Calvary's cross. Look there, if you would, in Hebrews 10. Uh, Hebrews 9, first of all. We're going to read some verses and go on. Hebrews 9, 21 through 28. 28. Read, read along with me. Here, here's the answer. Could these sacrifices take away sin? Moreover, He sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. This is Moses in the dedication of the tabernacle and all the book and all that back in Exodus. And almost all things are by law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. It was uh, therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things uh, themselves with better sacrifices than these. So these are all types, shadows, okay? And when, when you think of Abraham putting the knife up and ready to slay Isaac, you see, it's the gospel being presented. As the, uh, as the Israelite, individual Israelite would be coming with their lamb or whatever, they, 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 you know, depending on their prosperity, they would bring turtle doves, whatever it may be, and they're coming as a and because they have sinned and they're realizing that, that this is their substitute. But see, if they came by faith, you see, that was a needful thing. Not all Israelites came by faith, you see. They, went, they, they brought the prescribed offering. This is what, you know, see, they are Israelites. They have the tabernacle. They have the temple. They're Jews. They have the religion, okay? And they would go through the motions, and they would offer up what God, you know, in Isaiah, for example, God finally says, you know, I am just so sick, nauseated by all these sacrifices and stuff like that. He said, I want your heart. I want, I want purity. I want honesty. I want justice. See, the, the Israelites knew what to offer uh, like the Pharisee there in Luke, 9, like Luke 18, you know, uh, I tied everything, you know, I, they had it down to an automatic pilot. They, they knew everything. And God says, you're just doing it by rote, duty. Your heart is far from me. It wasn't acceptable. Though it was divinely instituted. Think of that for a minute. It was not acceptable. Why? Because there was not the heart of consecration. There was not faith there. Now, uh, verse 20, uh, we're there in Hebrews 9, uh, look at verse 24. Now, uh, the Hebrew writer uh, switches from Exodus to the shadows, uh, to the type, uh, types, to the anti -type, to the Lord Jesus. Okay? He's the fulfillment of all these sacrifices. The burnt offering, you want to, you know, the substitute, the burnt offering is the Lord Jesus. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, not to appear in the presence of God, but now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. When that, did that happen? That happened on Calvary's cross. And as it is appointed that the man wants to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered uh, to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And so the, the, this burnt offering, this this. This illustration of Abraham and Isaac, you see, in this expiration of removing of sin. It was a substitute. It was a whole burnt offering. It was totally acceptable to the Lord because it all pointed to what Christ would eventually accomplish. Look at Hebrews 10 for a minute. Let's go on. Uh, just read on verses 1 through 10. Again, uh, it, the scriptures explain it so well if we read it. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, 
can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereof unto perfect. For then would they have not have ceased to be offered. Because that the worshippers, once purged, should have no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Verse 5 is, is the, the, the antitype, the, the fulfillment. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering with thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. There is the, uh, the Lord Jesus, uh, the, the substitute, the, the burnt offering, the one who is going to give himself for the sins of his people. We can go on in those verses, but I want you to go down to verse 14. Look what it says there. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Dear ones, listen. Uh, we, we think of uh, all those lambs, all those rams, all those pigeons, all those animals sacrificed on the altars. Did it take away one sin? No, it didn't. No, it didn't. What were they good for? We'll see the type and the shadow, the figure. Uh, Fulfilled completely and accomplished, completely finished in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ alone. And that's, that's that idea of the, of the burnt offering. Uh, the second aspect of the burnt offering. <clears throat> expiration, forgiveness of sins. Do you know what was yesterday? Anybody know what yesterday was? Tim? Saturday. Hmm. Yeah, that's for sure. What else, Tim? Did you look on the calendar? It was Yom Kippur. What's Yom Kippur? It was the Day of Atonement in the Jewish in Judaism. And you, uh, we, we went through that, uh, the Sunday school uh, primary class. We went through the, the uh, Day of Atonement and Passover. We had the Passover in the back. It was, was kind of interesting. We kind of put uh, the uh, scriptural, orthodox, and some other things together. So. It was, it was interesting, but we went through the, we, we studied out the Day of Atonement. And so what would happen on the Day of Atonement? Well, it, 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 in, in a nutshell, the, yes, the high priest would go in, uh, in, into the most holy place, only once a year. And he would first offer uh, offerings for himself, sin offerings for himself, and then he would go in and uh, he would offer up uh, offerings for the nation of Israel for sins. And then, you remember the scapegoat. Okay, the scapegoat would be led out. Okay, and, and so that that that's and you could go to Leviticus 23, the Day of Atonement, sins of his, and, and uh, uh, you know you kind of wonder what what does an Orthodox Jew do today? Well, not not much because there's no temple. Uh, they do certain things, uh, prayers and stuff in the synagogues. But you see, and so the question is here as we think about this uh, uh, use or the, this uh, definition of a burnt offering or a whole burnt offering as a substitute, expiration, the forgiveness of sins. Um, if these blood offerings and, and the Day of Atonement and all these things didn't take away sin, why were they offered? Well, first of all, because they pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. And what did God do here on the Day of Atonement is that actually He would push Israel's sins ahead. He would push them ahead every year. Every year. He would push them ahead. When would they be dealt with? Well, see, that's, that's uh, uh, over, over the years, even Satan and, and uh, ungodly men and women will say, well, was it fair for that murderous David to be forgiven? Nothing that for me. Nathan comes to him, says, thou shalt not die. The little baby dies, but David doesn't die, Bathsheba doesn't die. Well, you know, uh, the law says, we can go to John 8, right? The law says, the law says that David and Bathsheba should be both put to death. Why would they forgive him? Well, God, that doesn't seem fair. Why, why would you say, say Rahab? Why would you say Abraham? He's an idolater. Idolaters are put to death. But you see, those are the questions about the integrity of God. And, and we'll see, on the Day of Atonement, you know, what God was doing was pushing those sins ahead. 
pushing those sins ahead, for finally, payday would come. When was that? Look at Romans chapter 3, verse 24 through 26. Romans 3, verse 24 through 26, gives us the answer. Now this is the grand doctrine of justification by faith alone, but, but see, within that, uh, you know, how was David saved? Well, he was saved by faith, through grace. The promise of the Messiah coming. You see, same as Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob. All those that came by faith. Sarah, all those, you know, from, from Genesis to Malachi, all those that came by faith. You see, they came and they prescribed their offerings and things of that sort. And, and they went through the Levitical washings and all those things there. But you see, what made a difference was that they came by faith looking forward to the day. Now, what do we do? We look back to an accomplished fact. They were looking forward to a time when Messiah Jesus would come and die on the cross as that substitute, as that whole burnt offering, and take away their sins. So look at Romans... Three. And notice what Paul says there. Verse 24. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. Notice that. That's, that's payment. Vicarious. Okay? Uh, the innocent dying for the guilty. Okay? Propitiation. Um, uh, satisfaction. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. What, what is Paul saying there? What, what, what sins, in a sense, is the remission of sins that were past? You see, there was a question of integrity. Well, God, how could you forgive David? Well, God would say, well, one day the substitute, his substitute is going to come. And one day, that sin of adultery and murder that David committed is going to be put on the Lord Jesus, and he's going to be punished for it, so David could have remission of sins. And, and, and that was God's plan all along, pushing those sins ahead, pushing the day of atonement, every time, pushing the sins ahead. Because, uh, you see, God wanted to fellowship with the Israelites. And if those sins weren't taken care of, and those sins weren't, in a sense, projected to the future, and, and laid upon the Lord Jesus, God would have wiped out Israel. There would have been no chance. There would have been no possibility for fellowship. Why? Because God is a thrice holy God. Same thing for us, brother. Oh yeah, we're, we have imputed righteousness. We've been justified. We're accepted in the blood. You, know, but, but you see, you know, and, and yes, eternal security and that, uh, all that and that. Uh, but see, God has done a work in our hearts, and we're going to be holy. And we're, we're, you know, so we can fellowship with Him. When we sin, uh, do we break fellowship? Do we grieve God, Holy Spirit? Yeah. What do we do? We go back to the blood. We go back to confession, repentance, forsaking our sin. You see, that, that's, there's nothing can wash away our sins uh, before we're saved, and there's nothing that can wash away our sins after we're saved. It's not, it's not that we get resaved. That's not what I'm saying. But you see, fellowship is restored, and we have an advocate with the Father, and He presents His blood, He presents His wounds, He presents His death, and God says, this is acceptable. It will always be acceptable, brother. That's the foundation. Boy, oh, there's no other foundation. It is a solid rock. And so, there is a, a you know, when Paul says this in Romans 3, 24 and 20, he, he's saying that there are people pointing fingers at God, saying, God, you don't sound pretty fair. You know, you destroyed the whole uh, aluminum world there in uh, Genesis 6, and, uh, you know, but you spared Noah. Noah was a drunkard, was he? No. He found grace in, in God's sight, but he, he had sin. He had sin, just like you and I. And so, God took care of that through the substitute, through the whole burnt offering. Since my Messiah has come and died and rose again, you see, it's once for all. Completed sacrifice, never to be completed again. Yeah, we're accepted totally in the beloved. I, I have further verses. We read some of them in Hebrews, but you know, Hebrews 10, 26 to 32. No, read Hebrews 9 and 10 this afternoon. Just take time. Just wow. Wow. 
It, it's all these sacrifices, all these blood, all this, all these offering, burnt offering, all these things point to one person, one transaction, and there's the Lord Jesus as our substitute, as our whole burnt offering, there dying on the cross, taking our sins and paying for them. That's expiration. That's that's the whole burnt offering substitution. So, substitution, substitutionary death, vicarious. All this matter, the whole burnt offering. First of all, it's for consecration. For consecration. The figure, the illustration, the picture, a heart, life, surrendered, offered totally up to God. And Paul says, this is your reasonable service. This is the bare minimum in light of what Christ has done for you and for me. But also, uh, in this idea of substitution, hope, or an offering, we have expiration or atonement, propitiation, uh, satisfaction. You see, it's a payment for our sins. Now, next week, Lord willing, as we partake of the Lord's table, again, Lord willing, I want to do substitution one more time. And it's going to be on the question, and think of this for a minute. Why does God require payment for our sins? Does that sound unfair? You see, the liberals, uh, liberal theology, <laughs> I, I was reading yesterday on, on the uh, uh, Islamic teachings, you know, li modern liberal Islamic are, are much like modern Christianity. They believe that God is, uh, can just forgive. He doesn't need to be. He's benevolent, which he is, right? For sure. As a sovereign, God could just forgive all the sins of everyone. Could he do that? Yeah, he could. But he doesn't. You see, he doesn't. He demands a payment. You see, when we think about how you know, God is benevolent, I'm benevolent. I forgive, God forgives. See, it sounds very reasonable, doesn't it? To the human mind. But dear ones, it's totally unbiblical. You see, sin is going to be paid for, whether uh, for your substitute paid for it, or you're going to spend eternity in hell paying for your sins, and you still won't get out, and you still won't be done paying it, because sin is against God. But God, in, in, in the, what God has revealed in the Scriptures, God requires a substitute, a payment. Sins will be paid for. Oh, how barbaric. We'll look at that next week. A little bit more. But let me conclude here. The Lord Jesus is our substitute. You see, God, the Lord Jesus, little ones, listen, He is a, what God has provided for the sins of His people. You know, we, we, we speak of John 3.16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. You see, God gave His Son as a ransom for redemption, to redeem us, to pay, to deliver us from the prison house of sin, from the debt we owe, for the sins we committed, the transgressions, for the hell, the wrath, all, everything we owe, He paid in our place. Instead, uh, the Lord Jesus says, even as the Son of Man came not to minister to unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. You see, he had to buy us. How did he buy us? By his shed blood, dying on the cross. But notice here also, we think of uh, he redeemed us, an atonement, an expiration, a sacrifice. And I want to close here. Look at Genesis 22. 22, verse 10. Again, we said... When you come to this portion of scripture, it, it's, it's, uh, it's the gospel illustrated, you know. I mean, people talk about, you know, let, you know uh, let's have comic books and, and uh, drama and, and uh, you know, uh, plays acting out. The, you know, that's what the Mass is actually, you know, dear ones. It's not of God at all, for sure. The Mass is a uh, repeat, replication or repeating of the, uh, of the crucified truth crucifixion of Christ. It's a bloodless sacrifice. It is idolatry. Okay? But basically what the priest is doing is reenacting the, the, the crucifixion of Christ. 
and uh, their idolatry and, and trans uh, sub changing the wafer and all that other stuff. We don't need to go there. But I'm saying, you see, we can go right here in Genesis 22 and watch Abraham and Isaac and see the gospel. See the need of a substitute, whether it's for dedication, like Abraham, or whether we need it for expiation, atonement, appreciation, satisfaction. The verse that caught my eye as I was trying to think of something to close, verse 10, and notice what it says there. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Do you remember when the, when the sword of the Lord and that realization that you were a sinner came to your heart and mind? You see, could you imagine that, that knife there being over you? Not too hard to imagine, isn't it? When you think in Galatians, uh, Genesis 3.24, uh, after uh, Adam and Eve were kicked out, it says, So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubs, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. You see, we were banned from the garden because we were criminals. And, and, and you see, we try you know, to go back to the garden, go back to God, and, and the swords of justice will... Slay you. Stop you. See, Abraham has a knife in his hand. And we said the knife pictures the justice of God. You see, the wages of sin is death. The soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. See, the scriptures say, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. You see, this is what God has revealed. Okay, in his holy word. You see, also, it says there in Exodus 29, 18, we mentioned it. Uh, let me read it to you. It says, And thou shalt burn the whole ram upon the altar. It is a burnt offering unto the Lord. It is a sweet savior, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. A sweet smelling savior as a descendant. Okay? In the presence of God, God says, I accept this. It's my son. It's perfect. And then also, I'm not trying to be crude, but you think of this. You know, this morning, brethren, the, 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 the smell of Christ is descending. Your worship, your heart, your motives, your attitudes, your words, your singing, your thought, everything. It's ascending before God, and God says, Boy, that smells good. That smells like my son. Accept it. But on the other hand, think of it for a minute. I'm not trying to be gross. How, how, how do you smell this morning? Tim, turn around. How do you smell this morning? You say, well, I took a bath, I got the odor, and I got my clean clothes on, right? My Sunday beds. But how do you smell this morning? See, that's the issue. Well, how, in a whole burnt offering, and, and, and God says, this is sweet-smelling savor, you see. How do you smell? How did I smell before God saved me in my works, in my religion, my heart? What ascended before the eye of a holy God, so pure that cannot look upon iniquity, would look upon me and you. You say, well, I, it's, I did something. Oh, no. Lord Jesus did it all. To him I. You see, as our heart thought, you know, like, you know, we were studying, I didn't get to, to, to uh, get all of it uh, this morning beside, but, you know, omniscience, omnipresence, omnipresence, he knows all. You, you think about that, he knows all. He's aware of all, he knows, he's aware of all the thoughts. And uh, I kind of say, well, I don't, I don't think he's thinking about all the thoughts of my heart before I was saved. That would be, that would be abominable, wouldn't it? It would stink to high heaven. And, and such, such thing uh, is, is what provokes God's wrath. Provoke God's wrath. And so this morning, if you're outside of Christ, you need a substitute. You need a whole burnt offering. You need a sacrifice that will atone, pay for your sins. You see, first of all, you see, the Lord Jesus sacrificed himself as, as totally consecrated, totally dedicated. 
to the cause of God's will, His Father's will. You see, but notice here, Christ obeyed in your place instead. Now think of that for a minute. In His consecration, as a whole burnt offering, as, as, as uh, we see Abraham there giving them his all, all his to God. He said, we see the Lord Jesus, what? Obeying in our place instead. See, he needed a perfect obedience. He needed a perfect righteousness. And in his, his consecration and in his dedication, the Lord Jesus worked it out for you and me. That we might have the garments of salvation. That we might be justified. But see, we needed a sacrifice. And God has provided and dear ones, what must we do? Well, we must come to Him in faith. Faith alone. That, that is. You know, the Catholics don't teach faith alone. A lot of Armenian or modern gospel, they don't teach faith alone. What does that mean? When you say re receive Christ or take Him by faith as your atoning sacrifice. You see, what it, the idea is this. Remember we said, little ones, you must come and lay your hands on the sacrifice. See, that's what... Uh, a believer does, or sinner does. He comes and puts his hands on the sacrifice. And what happens? He confesses sins. He acknowledges his sins. He forsakes and flees his sins. But you see, those sins are being transferred upon the substitute. And what happens? The substitute goes and is, is slain. That's what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as you, by faith, you come, you, you say, uh, God, I need an atoning sacrifice. I need a payment. I need a substitute. If you don't have a substitute this morning, you're going to die and go to hell. And then you'll begin to pay for your sins forever and ever because God is just and righteous and holy. But see, God has provided a sacrifice. And so we must turn from trusting ourselves and think for a moment. When you got a swift uh, or sniffed, you, you really, for one moment, you finally realize how bad you smell before God. Didn't that really change your life? You said you saw your sins as odious and abominable. <coughs> Vile. Wicked. And then what did you do? Most of us, you know, we need religion now. We start taking the soap out. We start cleaning ourselves up. We're going to go to church and we're going to get baptized. We're going to, you know, we're going to be moral. We still stink, don't we? Till we come to the Lord Jesus by faith. You know, sinners are found and filled with blood. Drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunge and use that flood and lose all their guilty stains. That's our hope, brother. That's the gospel. That's what we should preach. That's, that's what we live. That's our foundation. This morning, you smell pretty good in the nostrils of the Lord. Think about that for a minute. You smell pretty good. Because you're clothed and you're beautified with Christ. And God says, I accept that offering. I accept that worship. I accept that song of praise. I accept that gift in the offering. I accept that because it smells like my son. Brethren, that's substitution. That's whole burnt offering. That's dedication, that's expiration, and that's what our Lord did for us. And dear ones, this morning, if you're outside of Christ, you need to come and lay hands on the sacrifice. You need to flee from your sins and from the hell to come. And put your hands on the sacrifice. Say, oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. If you don't, you're going to perish. Because God will bring judgment upon you. And one day it says, it's appointed unto what? To die once and then the judgment. Yes, but now is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Call upon the name of the Lord today and say, Oh God, I'm a guilty vow. I've got a swift of my sins. I smell horrible. What could wash them away? It's the blood of Christ. By faith come to Him. That's what we've done by God's grace. And God says, I will accept you. I will never cast you out. Why? Because God has received the sacrifice. His Son... Son. Will you not do that this morning? Little ones, young people, adults, listen. Listen. Put your hands there by faith. Lay your hands on the sacrifice. God's provision. Say, oh God, take away my sins. Transfer my sins to the substitute. Would you do that, Lord?
take my sins away. Take away the filth. Take away the judgment. Oh Lord, take away and put them on your darling son. Let's pray. Lord, we, we rejoice in your provision this morning. Lord, as we are reminded of the stink and the stench of our sins, of our religion, of our attitudes, what we try to offer up to you like the Pharisee there in Luke 18. Oh God, aren't you thankful you have people like us Thank you for your saving grace. Thank you for the illuminating work of God, Holy Spirit. Thank you for the cleansing blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That we came as sinners, lost, undone, repenting, turning, by, by your grace. We came to that fountain filled with blood. What a gracious Savior. Thank you, Father, this morning that, that we are accepted in the Beloved. And that we can offer up ourselves, we can offer up sacrifices that are pleasing to you. Well pleasing, it says, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Bless now, we pray. Work of mighty work in those that are lost. And Lord, give us grace, we pray in Jesus' precious name.